Hello everyone, and welcome to our second annual End War event. My name is Anna Kolar, I am the game director for this game, and I will be walking you through our rules and safety guidelines for our 2018 event. So before we even get into what HVZ is, let's start it off with some basic attitude expectations. Because honestly, how you behave and treat others in the field means way more to the people playing and running the game than how well you play. So let's start off with the keystone of HVZ. It's called Rule Zero or Rule One. Changes from place to place, sometimes with different phrasing, but it always carries the same meaning. Don't be a jerk. Do unto others as they would do unto you. The golden rule, etc. For example, this player just broke our good friend Lizzie's nose, and now it's going to be immortalized in this rules and safety film forever. You're welcome, Lizzie. Speaking of, if someone does get hurt in the field, stop gameplay. If a moderator isn't around, do it yourself. Call 911 if necessary immediately. Then contact the moderators to let them know about the situation. Yeah, I think he's dead. He's not moving. His beard's sort of going in the wind. It's kind of majestic, but... To avoid this situation, just avoid hurting yourself. If it seems like an unsafe idea, don't do it. Or just don't complain if you get hurt. Your real life safety is always more important than avoiding a tag. If you die in real life, you die in the game. And vice versa. If it seems like you might hurt someone else, just don't do it at all. If it seems like you're cheating, you probably are. Stop it. If it seems like you might get the game banned, can you not? And just some other basic rules. Remember that everyone is an idiot. Yeah, but I'm not spawn, so how did it hit me? You oh, yeah, so this tag doesn't count. You no, you did it. You did it. Don't be lame. <laughs> Radic. Style points are superior to winning. A moderator's decision is final in any situation. A police officer's decision is final in every situation. And now, an important note from our sponsors. You should really wear eye protection. Seriously, you'll put an eye out with those things. You have so many options to choose from. Sunglasses, actual protective wear, or even just your regular glasses. And now, back to your regularly scheduled briefing. So let's talk about what you need to do before you can attend your first mission. First, register. You should have done this already. If you haven't, you managed to miss all of our well-placed signs and are doing things out of order, you rebel. Please leave the room and go do this now. If you told us you need emergency medication or treatment in this registration, please make sure you keep what you need on you at all times. Next, sign a waiver. You also do this when you register, but if you're under 18, this waiver must also be signed by a parent or guardian. If you're under 16, this parent must be with you, not just on campus, but with you at all times. If you're found without your parent, you will be sitting in the briefing room. If you're under the age of 12, you aren't actually allowed to play. I feel like you should have known this before you got into this room. After that, attend a rules and safety briefing. Good news, you're already here. A moderator should be distributing wristbands now. Please put it on and leave it on for the weekend. If it falls off, just bring the band back to prove you attended and we'll put another one on you. So again, you need to register, sign a waiver, and attend a rules and safety briefing. Then you're ready to attend your first mission. Now, due to a limited space and a lot of mission options and teeny tiny rooms, we have to do things a little different than you're probably used to because we don't have a space where we can easily address all of you at once. When you went through registration, you should have been asked to pick out a slip of paper relating to your next mission. This is called a briefing ticket. Briefing tickets are how you gain access to your building. There should be several pieces of information listed on this ticket, specifically what mission the ticket concerns what time the briefing starts. Now, this is the time the moderator is pushing play on the briefing. If you're late, they will not be starting it over. A room number. Make sure you're in a group with the people you want to play the mission with. You're absolutely allowed to trade the tickets between people, but if you're in a bind, it can't hurt to stop by the room to see if there's still space. Just don't miss your own briefing. So, you got your first briefing ticket at registration. What do you do for the rest of the briefings? Like I said, the time listed on your schedule is the time the mod in the room will press play on the briefing. So you'll want to stop by the briefing room sometime after mission ends and the next one begins to get the ticket for your next briefing. 
When you pick out your ticket, be sure to pick one that the rest of your friends have. Sometimes each group will get an adjective to choose from. Sometimes it will just be a group number. However, this typically indicates the group you'll be sticking with for the next mission. And now that you have all your paperwork out of the way, let's go over how HVZ even works with some basic game mechanics. The goal of the game is simple. Humans want to complete mission objectives or, failing that, die in the most glorious way possible. Meanwhile, it's the goal of the zombies to tag all of the humans and bring them over to the winning team. To participate, you're first going to need an orange bandana. This can be one that you have lying around, that you bought from the store, or that you obtained from Drac at Bumcon. All players start the game as a human, unless they volunteer as a starter, with their bandana on their arm. The side doesn't matter. No hidden nosies here! Remember that your bandana must remain visible at all times. It should be in a roughly 2 inch wide band when worn. We know they sometimes roll up, but try to keep an eye out for it. And definitely don't try to camouflage or hide your bandana. As a zombie, your bandana goes around your head in a 2 inch band as well. Also make sure your bandana does not unroll into a sheet. Never use it as a face covering. While we know it's habit, if you have long hair, avoid tucking your bandana under it. Keep the band visible at 360 degrees. Your bandana is, likewise, not a hair tie. And regardless of your team, your bandana should not ever be removed or obscured, even if in a no-play zone or safe zone. Hey you, what do you think you're doing? You can't do that in here, you rapscallion! Alright, so you're a human walking around outside and you want to defend yourself from the horde. So, how do you do that? By stunning. Humans stun zombies by hitting them with approved ammunition from an approved armament. Ammunition must be launched from a blaster or blowpipe and may not be thrown. No throwing darts! Also no melee. And no marshmallows. To actually stun the zombie, you just need to hit any part of them, anything attached to them, or anything they are holding with approved ammunition. This includes costume pieces, backpacks, etc. And while heavily discouraged, headshots will still count, but remember rule number one and please don't aim there. In order to stun those zombies, you're going to need a weapon. The most popular kind of weapon is the blaster. Out of the package, most are just fine. It's once you get into homebrews and modification that you can run into trouble. So let's start on the outside of the blaster. We aren't too picky about the coloration, but state and local laws require that all armaments have a blaze orange tip. That being said, if your armament causes issues, we reserve the right to cover it in a brightly colored tape, specifically the most embarrassing print we own. Looking at the internals, the blaster must fire at an average rate no faster than 130 feet per second. If a player is found to have knowingly increased the FPS of their blaster after having it tested, the player will be immediately removed from the game. Using an unapproved blaster, or one that has previously failed inspection, will result in a warning or a ban. If it appears that any blaster is capable of having its velocity increased or decreased at the player's discretion past the allowed FPS rate, we will not allow the blaster in the game. Blasters that can be programmed before the time of registration to fire at or below the allowed FPS rate on its maximum setting will be allowed. So if you don't buy your blaster at a store and want to make it at home, that's allowed too. Those which fall under the allowed FPS will be allowed within the game. HPA, or High Pressure Air Blasters, will not be allowed. We also don't allow paintball, airsoft, or zingbo products. Those are for different games. But what if you want to hit things really far away and your stock blaster just isn't cutting it? That's where blowpipes come in. Blowpipes may be no longer than 4 feet in total length. We recommend, but do not require, players use a large mouthpiece that covers an area wider than the mouth to prevent injury to one's own mouth should the blowpipe be hit. So now you have an approved armament, but what exactly can you hit the zombies with to stun them? Let's start with darts. Well, for starters, you can use almost any stock dart that comes with the blaster you purchase. We allow Boomco, Busby, and Nerf in both Elite and Mega styles. We also allow many off-brand darts. Some examples include Waffle Style, such as those by E-Kind, Little Valentine, and others, Koosh, AccuStrike, AccuFake, Vowberry, Little Valentine, Vortex Discs, Rival Balls, and Rockets. We specifically do not allow any ammunition whose tip does not squish 
or that seems hard to the touch. Specific examples include full vinyl jacket or china darts, all nipple darts, Stefan's or half-length darts, and that includes worker Stefan's. If you bring banned ammunition, you will be asked to not use it. If you choose to use it anyway, you may be banned. Regardless of the ammunition in question, players may not modify their ammunition in any way through addition or removal of pieces. Ammunition must be used as it arrives in its packaging. If you happen to pick up excess ammunition while in the field, it should be returned to a dark collection pile outside of the briefing room. If you need more ammunition, feel free to pull from this pile, but never take more than you used. That's a rule one violation. So what if you run out of ammunition while fighting zombies? Or your blaster jams on you? That's where sock bombs come in. Sock bombs are the exception to the ammunition rule. They must be thrown by hand and may not be launched out of some other device. That includes your feet. Or noob tubes, which are tubes containing socks. Or, as absolutely epic as it would be, entire laundry baskets full of socks. I know, I know, I wish we could too. You may, however, throw more than one sock at a time. But they do need to be taken out of the package first, silly. And socks must leave your hand in order to count as a stun. So what are the guidelines for making these mad sock creations? First, sock bombs can be made of socks of any size, but must contain only one sock. Tape can be used to keep the sock together, but it must be applied in no more than three layers. You can make them in any size, but be sure at least 50% of the initial sock remains exposed. Velcro may also be affixed to the sock to aid in attaching the sock to a vest, blaster, etc., using the hard or the soft side of the Velcro, whichever is your preference. The most important rule is just that the sock bomb must squish. Also, no sock flails of any variety. Or bolos. How much illegal stuff do you have, Bogue? Speaking of banned stuff, there are a couple other banned objects that you cannot use to arm yourself with. Those include Nerf or other brand grenades, and unmanned or remote control blasters or drones or vehicles with blasters attached. So that's regular humans for you. But occasionally during the game, you might have to interact with special human characters, sometimes referred to as NPCs. These special humans are indicated by a yellow armband in place of the usual orange and are played by moderators. If you run into one, assume they cannot be tagged by any normal means, if at all, and that they're important to the plot in some way. So you've been having a grand old time as a human, and you got tagged. It happens to all of us eventually. Welcome to the winning team! So, how does it happen? And what do you do? In order to be tagged, all a zombie needs to do is place one full palm on you, anywhere on your body, or on anything attached to you. More on that later. As a human, you'll obviously want to avoid this as long as possible, but make sure you follow rule number one. And you should never feign an injury or flop to avoid a tag. Players caught repeatedly doing this will be examined and potentially removed from the game. After you're tagged, you are immediately considered an active zombie. Welcome to the horde. Move yourself the necessary spawn distance, 30 feet, away from the nearest human, and move your bandana to your head to begin tagging. Remember, to avoid confusion and a mess, make sure to put your armaments and ammunition away after you've been turned. We're moderators, not your moms. And believe me, in the hot summer, getting all of your gear off will be amazing. But what if you're under 16 and have to play with an adult? Well, if one of you is turned before the other, it is the Guardian's responsibility to do one of the following. One, disband and continue to follow the Miner. Two, designate a new temporary Guardian for the Miner, preferably someone you know and or trust. Three, require the Miner to become a zombie. Now that you're a zombie, you'll be getting stunned by humans. So how does that work? Like we said before, a zombie is stunned when they are hit with an approved bit of ammunition anywhere on the body or on anything attached to their body. The first important note is that ricocheted ammunition does not count. It is also important to note that zombies cannot normally block darts with any sort of shield. More on that later. Zombies also may not use inactive zombies or non-players as cover, ever. However, they may use natural cover, such as buildings or trees, to hide themselves. But what do you do with yourself when you're stunned? First, immediately remove yourself from gameplay. If there's a line of firing humans, you want to remove yourself from the line of fire as quickly as possible. 
Do not stand and meet shield, or stand in front of a firing line to prevent humans from firing at what's behind you. Next, you need to show the players around you that you are stunned. So, to show others you are inactive, move your bandana to your neck, or if this is difficult, remove the bandana entirely and hold it visibly within your hand. If things are chaotic, just put your hands over your head until you can get out of the way and take your bandana down. If you don't do this, players may shoot you again. So, now that you're out of the way and things have calmed down, what can you do? You can pick up darts to give back to the humans. Do not attempt to use returning darts as a way to tag a human. That's going to be a giant violation of Rule Zero. Also, do not pick up darts with the intent of keeping humans from retrieving them or destroying them. That's just rude. If the humans are walking away, you are also welcome to follow them. But, if stunned, zombies may only directly follow humans if they are part of a mission group. If zombies aren't part of a mission group, they must break line of sight before pursuing. So what shouldn't you do as a stunned zombie? You should not interfere with the game in any way. Wait till Paul hears about this. That includes relaying any intelligence regarding the human location, except where you were stunned, how many humans were there when you were stunned, and how long ago you were stunned. Once you're stunned, you're not out of the game forever. So when and how do you respawn? We utilize something called rolling respawns. That means that all zombies respawn at the same time based on the clock, regardless of when you were stunned. You don't have an internal timer. For example, we have respawns set on the fives. That means that all zombies respawn at 305, 310, 315, etc. Please note that respawn times may fluctuate throughout the game, or even possibly in the middle of a mission. When a respawn happens, if there are humans in the area, you can't just spawn next to them, as tempting as it is. You need to move 30 feet away from the nearest human player, which is called the spawn distance. Once you've ensured you, or they, are far enough away, all you need to do to re-enter the game is move your bandana back to the active position on your head and re-enter. An important note, the zombie cannot make tags until the bandana is secured back in this position. The bandana must stay where it is without being held on. Another important note, humans may not stalk zombies to prevent them from spawning. This violates rule one. Zombies can wait to respawn past the respawn timer if they are doing so to avoid getting spawn camped, meaning that the humans are standing too close to allow them to spawn, purposefully. However, they must begin moving away when the respawn occurs to get 30 feet away. Eventually, someone won't be paying attention, or you're going to get around their defenses. So, how do you go about tagging a human? Like we said earlier, it just takes one full palm placed on a human with firm contact to turn them into a zombie. And, as a reminder, humans can be tagged anywhere on their body and on anything attached to them, including costume pieces, backpacks, etc., with one exception. Any item a human has in hand, which they are actively using, that could be blasters, flashlights, etc., cannot be tagged. This being said, it should never be used by a human to block a tag either. Furthermore, keep your tags appropriate. Stay out of the no-no square. The swimsuit zone. You know exactly what I'm talking about. It should also go without saying, but HVZ is not a full contact sport. Do not be overly aggressive. No, tackling, slapping, punching, etc. Whether or not a tag is too aggressive will always be left to moderator discretion, and violations could result in an immediate ejection from the game depending on the severity. If you want to avoid tackling others but aren't quite sure how, try to run past humans and not directly at them. But so long as you're following all of these rules, there is no limit on the number of tags a zombie may get in one go. Sometimes we want to give our zombies a little extra oomph, and that's where perks come in. These can be given to any player based on mission failures, because people helped out, or even just for wearing eye protection. However, once you have been given a perk, you cannot trade it out to another player until after the mission concludes. One perk you'll see handed out is the shield. Unfortunately, ours will not be anywhere near as nice as the one shown here. This is one of the approved items which can be used by zombies to block darts. But you cannot tag humans with it, so no shield bashing. Another perk is the noodle. It's a simple pool noodle, but it can be used to both block darts and to tag players. Even a graze with a noodle will count as a tag. Players have a maximum of two for obvious reasons. One more perk is the horde egg. This is a dodgeball, which, like the noodle and shield, can be used to block darts. However, it can also be thrown. 
Hitting a human, however, does not count as a tag. Instead, the human must take a knee until another human places a full palm on them. During this time, they are still allowed to defend themselves. Keep in mind that only active zombies can throw or kick the ball, but inactive zombies can help by retrieving the ball for the thrower as long as they stay out of the way of active fire. Humans cannot and should not interact with the horde egg at all. You should not be kicking or touching it for any reason, remember rule one. And also you'll just horde egg yourself. The last perk is the necro. This perk is indicated by wearing a flagging tape necklace. Zombies with this perk are able to respawn other zombies within a 15-foot radius by dancing with them for 30 seconds. All zombies wishing to respawn, and the zombie respawning them, must be dancing for the entirety of the 30 seconds. The necro zombie may only use this power once per spawn. And, as you might have inferred, if the necro zombie is stunned, they cannot respawn other zombies until after they themselves respawn as well. There are even more types of deadly zombies called Special Infected, but these can only be played by someone on End War staff or an approved moderator from another school. Special Infected always wear a yellow bandana in addition to some other indicator specific to that type of zombie. The most important thing to remember about these special zombies is what we call the yellow bandana rule, which is as follows. If you weren't briefed, or if you forgot your briefing and run into someone wearing a yellow bandana on their head, Assume that zombie will try to kill you. Assume that zombie cannot be stunned by any normal means. And if you just look confused and leave it alone, it will probably leave you alone as well. Maybe. Here are some examples of special infected we will have roaming around the campus. We'll start out with one of the best known specials, the tank. This one will be easy to tell. You'll know a special is a tank because it will be yelling loudly about the fact that it is a tank. It typically only walks, but can absolutely move faster. Usually its pace is set. To deter a tank, you just shoot it with a dart, hit it with a sock, etc. When hit, it will stop in place and count to three before it can move again. You cannot stun lock it, meaning that if you hit it again, its counter will not reset. But you can kite it. What that means is that the tank will typically pursue whatever is shooting at it, at least for a little while. It's also important to remember that the tank always gets one step and one swipe after they reactivate, even if immediately hit with additional ammunition, so stay out of their swing radius. Next, let's take a look at the boomer. To tell whether or not a special infected is a boomer, look to see if it's carrying a staff. So how does it work? The boomer can walk or lightly jog, but may not run. When shot, the boomer will boom. When this happens, it will yell, boom! stop in place, and begin counting down from a number while swinging the staff in a circle in the air. For as long as it's counting down, it is a respawn point for zombies. Zombies, please run around the boomer in the direction the staff is moving to avoid collisions. After this, the boomer is stunned for a period of time. You will not always be made aware of this time, so it's a good idea to get away from it quickly. To tell if the boomer is active or not, watch for their bandana. It will only be active if the bandana is on its head. Remember, the boomer can still tag you if you screw up, but the boomer will typically prefer to boom, which, if active, it can do whenever and wherever it likes if you don't shoot it first. Boom, ten, nine, the final classic special infected we will be covering today is the witch. To tell if the special is a witch, look to see if it is crouched, making whimpering or crying sounds. You will want to avoid activating the witch, which you can do by shooting it or making too much noise. How much noise is too much noise? A good rule of thumb is to make sure that you are always quieter than the witch. If you set the witch off, it will scream as a warning, then charge in the direction of whatever bothered it. So don't get in between them. It is then unstunnable for 5 seconds or until it gets a kill. If it doesn't get a kill, make sure you stun it to stop it from chasing you. These are a new type of special called the Rook. These specials are identifiable by the large shields they carry in addition to their yellow bandana. They move slowly, even slower than a tank, but are not stunnable by normal ammunition. Instead, you must hit them in the shield with three sticky bugs. These will be made available to players when they unlock them via a mission and can be transferred between players. Please be aware, 
rooks cannot tag you. However, they make really excellent meat shields. This all seems simple, but inevitably you'll find yourself in a dispute. The zombie thinks they tagged the human, the human thinks they shot the zombie, what then? If a human and zombie cannot come to an agreement over what happened, follow the chain. First, defer to any moderators who witnessed the event. If they didn't see, or if they think it was too close to call, defer to any players not within your own group who can say for certain what happened. If no one saw what happened, or can agree on what happened, you may choose any game of luck or skill that will satisfy both parties, including, but not limited to, a coin flip, arm wrestling, and etc. Just remember that if you still cannot reach a resolution on your own, the moderators will decide a method of resolution for you, and if they must do this, they will pick the most entertaining option available to them. And that's basically it for gameplay. You just keep going until the human team meets a win condition, all humans have become zombies, or at the conclusion of the final mission. A note on that last point, though. You have to actually be present and active at the final stand. If you aren't in attendance, or if you hid through the final stand, or you just ran away for the whole thing, you will be considered dead when the final stand concludes. But where does the game take place? Well, that's one of the coolest things about Athens, in my opinion. OU campus, Athens city, Ohio, the country. It's all considered within our boundaries, so long as you are registered and wearing a bandana. And remember, once you're playing, you aren't allowed to take that bandana off. So, you are in play coming and going from dinner, the grocery store, your hotel, just about anywhere. There are, of course, exceptions. No play zones. These are areas in which no gameplay may take place because it was requested by campus, police, or just for the safety of players in their environment. These areas should be completely avoided unless you have an out-of-game reason to enter. This includes the inside of buildings, unless overridden by a moderator, areas under construction, streets, private property without the current resident's permission, and gardens. Specifically, avoid Athens City Parking Garage on the corner of West Washington and College Streets. All other parking garages, however, are in open play. Additionally, we have made the area surrounding the briefing building and its adjacent parking lot a no-play zone this year. So what do you do if you need to interact with a no-play zone? You should get in and out as quickly as possible. And while you're there, you should not shoot darts or attempt to tag each other. Buildings are no-play zones with their own rules. For all buildings except the briefing room, which exists in its own little bubble, there are special rules for entering and exiting. When entering a building, we use something called the daisy chain rule to prevent people from getting crushed in doorways. It starts off simple. When you touch a door handle, you are safe as long as the door opens and is unlocked. When you're in a group, once person one has placed their hand on the door, any person in physical contact with that person, their gear, or their clothing, we'll call them person two, is also safe. Anyone in contact with person two then is safe as well, and so on and so forth. If you're not in contact with that daisy chain, you're not safe. Likewise, if someone lets go in the chain, everyone they are connecting to the chain is now unsafe. You can also break the chain by attacking a member of the opposing team. There are some other general rules about doors you should be aware of. First, don't use a door as a safe zone, and don't camp the doors. Either go in or stay out. You're a player, not a cat. Probably. Next, if humans are gathered near a door but aren't going inside, please do not charge them. Somebody will get hurt. Speaking of getting hurt for real, streets, unlike parking lots or garages, are another kind of special no-play zone because during gameplay, you will frequently find yourself forced to interact with them. If you die in real life, you die in the game and cars will kill you. Don't do anything that might get yourself or someone else hurt or worse by running into a road. Recklessness in roadways may result in a ban. So if you're being chased by another player, while it's very tempting, do not run into the road to escape. If you are being pursued, you must either stun or evade your pursuer before you can cross. 
If you need to cross the street in a large group, moderators will likely pause the game to do so, resuming gameplay on the other side when everyone is across safely. More on game pauses later. And there is one final type of no-play zone, which is the vehicle. For the sake of this video, we're going to call any device a vehicle, which assists a person in moving but isn't required for the person's regular motion. Examples include, but are not limited to, bicycles, roller skates, scooters, hoverboards, cars, skateboards, heelys, pogo sticks, rideable animals, flying objects, etc. If it seems like it might be classified as a vehicle, it probably is. But we recognize you obviously still need to use vehicles, so how can you do that without breaking the rules? When entering a vehicle, you are safe once your hand is on the handle of the door, provided that 1. The vehicle is unlocked. You have 10 seconds to prove you have entry. 2. The vehicle has a handle. And 3. The owner of the vehicle is allowing you entry. Otherwise, you are safe once your foot is in or on the vehicle, whichever is applicable. While inside, vehicles are basically mobile no-play zones. While in or on a vehicle, depending on the type of vehicle, you may not shoot or tag people outside, and you can't be stunned or tagged while inside. So far we've been talking about no-play zones. These should never be confused with safe zones. Safe zones are also considered out of play, but these can be used to avoid other players. Humans can't be tagged, and zombies can't be stunned while they're within these areas, which can be created and destroyed as moderators see fit. To enter a safe zone, you just need to get one foot fully inside of the safe zone. Not half a foot, not a toe, not a hand, one whole foot. Inside the safe zone, you cannot participate in gameplay outside of the safe zone. If you attempt to do so, we will kick you out of the safe zone. And also, don't attempt to force players out of a safe zone. That is a giant violation of rule one. So now that you've made it into a safe zone, or a no-play zone, how do you exit? Humans are safe for five seconds, five steps, or until they shoot, whatever happens first. Similarly, zombies are stunned for five seconds or five steps, whichever happens first. And during this time, they can be stunned until the next respawn by a human if shot. If and when things go wrong, sometimes we have to call for a game pause, which you have already seen a few times in this video. But how does that work? When moderators need to stop the game, they will signify this with a long whistle blow. As soon as you hear that the game is halted, stop exactly where you are as though someone pushed pause on a video game. You may then sit, or kneel, or stand, while you wait for play to resume. You may not pick up darts, reload, or do anything to impact the game in any way. But feel free to hydrate, relax, apply more sunscreen, and talk quietly with the players around you, including planning what to do after play resumes. When the moderators are ready to end the pause, they will typically let you know and give you time to get ready. They will then count down and end the pause with another long whistle blow. Gameplay immediately resumes at this point. Now, let's take a moment to talk about the largest source of pauses during busy campus hours, non-players. These individuals always have the right of way. Moderators can and will temporarily halt gameplay in an area to allow non-players to pass. And in the absence of moderators, it is the responsibility of the individual players to temporarily halt the gameplay in an area to allow for the passage of non-players. Players may not use non-players to gain any advantage in game. This includes, but is not limited to, hiding amongst a group of non-players, requesting information that will aid you in the game, or using them as human shields. And now let's address some other campus safety concerns that don't really fit into any of these other categories. When it comes to moving around campus, the rules are very lax. If you want to jump or climb, go for it. But use your own common sense to prevent yourself or others from getting injured. Again, if you die in real life, you die in the game. While style points are superior to winning, Athens police do not allow masks or face coverings unless they're required for medical or religious purposes. Players may not wear masks or anything else that obscures their face. You may use face paint or makeup, but prosthetics fall under this rule as well. And please, leave fake blood at home. It made a mess in the past and resulted in us getting fined. 
as we have many night missions, you'll likely want to use a flashlight, and that's fine. However, you may not use any strobe feature or strobe the light manually. Not only is that painful for our players, but can potentially trigger an epileptic seizure in some individuals. If a flashlight causes problems for any reason, we reserve the right to ban its use. In case of any emergencies, please keep your eyes and ears open for an update from the mods. I'll have a list of ways to do that later on in the video. But specifically relating to weather, HVZ is a rain or shine event. However, if it's miserable out and no one is having fun anymore, or if lightning is striking within an unsafe distance, roughly 15 miles, we will temporarily call the game. And finally, please do not harass the wildlife. As an additional note for End War 2018, we have been asked to warn you that Grounds has located hemlock seeds in the mulch. Hemlock, as you may know, is poisonous. Touching it won't harm you, but I guess wash your hands if you touch the mulch before you eat? Just uh, don't eat any weird seeds you find on the ground. All right, now let me have my soapbox moment for a minute here with one special note. All of us play this game to have fun, and we try very hard to cultivate a positive player community. As someone once said to me, rule number one shouldn't be don't be a jerk, it should be everyone must be friends. We're a weird group of people to a lot of the outside world, and if we can't look after each other like real friends, then this game doesn't stand a chance of lasting. So this may sound harsh, but if you're creating a toxic play environment, you will be asked to stop or even be removed from the game. Period. And hey, don't take yourself so seriously. Remember, we're playing games with children's toys. In costumes. Role-playing zombie hunters. Well, anyway, that was a lot of rules, but breaking one isn't typically the end of the world. You will likely receive at least one warning before you face any punishment. However, there is a small list of actions that will result in you being immediately banned. This includes sexual assault, purposeful destruction or theft of property belonging to the university, end war, or another player, modifying darts with the intent to cause added pain or injury, breaking of local or state laws, and involving oneself in a physical altercation. With all of that out of the way, let's take a moment to talk about roles in the game outside of players, starting with medics. Medics are wonderful volunteers who have offered to help out in case players actually get injured over the weekend. These individuals have been given a white bandana to wear on their upper arm in addition to their player bandana if they are playing. They have a variety of backgrounds, from simple first aid training to actual doctors. If you think you would qualify for this role, make sure to let a moderator know and we will give you the contact information for our head medic. And, of course, the moderators which we have mentioned several times throughout this video. These are the volunteers who play characters, special infected, referee the game, and help keep End War running behind the scenes the rest of the year. If you need a mod because you're having an issue, need a dispute settled, or have a question, just look for the people wearing a lot of pink. We always will have on a pink armband, but occasionally we'll also be found wearing pink shirts and pink glow sticks. Here are our various moderators and some of the jobs you'll see them doing. If you bump into one, say thanks and maybe give them a high five. A lot of these individuals, after working full-time jobs or going to school, put another 20 hours of unpaid work in every week just to give you guys a fun weekend. The first type of moderator is the probationary moderator, or probies. These are newbies to the End War staff, but not necessarily to moderating. And they're doing great! Give them an extra pat on the back. Hey, I'm Brian. I live here in Columbus, Ohio. I have been cast as Gavin Goose. Hey, this is Jamie Heston from the Bay Area in California, and I'm playing Saffron. Hi, I'm John Proctor. I'm from Springfield, Missouri, and I'm playing Ricky Rat. Hey, everybody. My name is Judah, and I will be playing Shiva, the tiger. I'm from BG Undead. That's my home org. Shout out to my guys over there. And I can't wait to see you at End War. My name's Nick Moy. I am from Long Island, New York, and I will be playing as Roxy the Rat. Hello, everyone. My name is Raymond Devine. I was one of your End War moderators last year, and I'll be doing the same thing this year. Currently reside in the South, though I am originally from Ohio. And as for my character this year, well, let's just say my character will be, uh, wonder-filled. Hi, I'm Thomas from New York, and I'm going to be playing Ash for Endwood this year. These are our inducted and war moderators. Make sure to find one of these fine people first with any questions or concerns you have. Hey everybody, my name is Ari. I'm one of your moderators for Endwar this year. I'm from Louisville, Kentucky, and I moderate the Naptown Nerf Club, which is a PvP war in Indianapolis, Indiana. 
This year I'll be playing the Bay Bay Special, which is a chicken, and I'll be Chuckles as well. And I can't wait to see you guys out there. Hey, I'm Brian from the University of Pittsburgh in Pitt Urban Gaming, and this end war I will be playing Wandy. Hope to see you on the field. And go. Hi, I'm Janine Richardson from Springfield, Missouri, and I'm playing Corona. Hi, I'm Roger Page. This is Luna. I'm from wherever you want to say you're from, and I will be playing Pearl. These next few are our Athens moderators. If you're looking for directions or information on where to eat, make sure to find one of these individuals. Hello, my name is Anthony Rohn. My home state is Ohio, and my home school is Athens. I will more than likely be out on the field as specials at some point in time. you catch on the flip side, guys. Hey, everybody. My name is Chris Denishek. I'm from Athens, Ohio, and I'm going to play the dog Saturn. Hi, End Warriors. I'm Melinda. I'm one of the host mods here for HPC Athens, and I get to play Princess Nev. Can't wait to see y'all. Hello. I'm also now Nathan Liam in the stunt double. He is an Athens local mod, and um, he should be playing the role of Vanessa? And now for some roles that require a bit more explanation. Hi, I'm Steve Curry, and I'll be returning to End War from Bowling Green, Ohio as a super secret character. Steve will be handling our player complaints all weekend. If you're concerned about the game, if you had something happen to you on campus, or if you're having issues with another player, Steve's your person. They'll make sure the right people know what's going on. Hi, my name is Dennis. I am from New Paltz, New York, and I will be playing the intern coordinator, Chad. Dennis is our point of contact for players with disabilities. If you would like us to provide accommodations for your disability, please reach out to Dennis. Hey guys, what's up? I'm Tyler. I'm from Youngstown State University, where I've been a mod since 2012. I'm going to be your zombie mod this weekend, and I'm in charge of the dossiers. Hope you have a great time. Tyler is going to be our zombie moderator for the weekend, but he's also in charge of our dossiers and BFG. Contact him if you get separated from the horde or listen for him. And this is me. Like I said, I'm the game director. I'm sort of like a president and an event planner all rolled into one. You'll see me floating around missions, making sure everything is balancing properly and everyone is where they're supposed to be. Contact me if things have gone seriously wrong, but please try to find another moderator first. You can also contact me for drink specials, words of encouragement, or job offers. What's up, guys? My name is Drac, and boy, do I sure love Nerf things. I really, really am Drac, or as my YouTube name, you sure do know me as Lord... Didgeridoo. Don't forget, Judicania is my favorite moderator, and I am very much Drac Tortellini. I will be playing a character at this event. It's whatever my last name is pronounced as. Thalassa. Thalassa? See at and more. And I don't think this vampire requires any introduction. This game would not be here if it weren't for Drac, so make sure you give him a big thank you if you haven't already. So, play the missions, follow the rules, listen to the moderators, great! What do I do if I get bored though? Well, make sure you check out our brochure and vacation planning guide to find fun things to do around town. That should have been emailed to you, or there's probably QR codes floating around. But why leave when we have even more planned for you? Tyler, why don't you tell us a bit about dossiers in the BFG? Hey guys, I'm Tyler, and I am the admin for the Endwar dossier team this year. I just wanted to make this short video to go over what a dossier is, where you might find them, what will be in them, and what we're doing differently from last year. So here we have a scene of what appears to be a totally empty area. There doesn't seem to be any dossiers here, right? Well, actually, there's a couple. Dossiers are a trophy, and as such, they aren't always the easiest thing to spot in the wild. Sometimes you've got to dig a little bit. After all, it's not as cool to say, yeah, I was just strolling around and picked up five dossiers because they were right out in the open. So, when it comes to finding a dossier, remember that the bare minimum requirement for them to be hidden is to have at least some part of it visible from some angle. So double check that spot you thought you searched, crawl around, look everywhere. They're out there, I promise. One of my personal favorites from last year was hidden about five feet outside of the door of the building we had the briefings in, and sure enough, it was still there Sunday when we left. So last year we hid 100 dossiers on the campus, and only about 30 or so were found and reported in. 
We read the feedback, saw that there weren't enough time to search for them, they weren't necessarily worth searching for, or they were too hard to find. Well, we're going to fix two out of those three issues. Sorry, they're still going to be hard to find. This year, there will be some more time between missions, and there's definitely a better reason to go out and find them. So let's talk about this year. There will be 101 dossiers hidden around campus this year. Each of them will contain a few special prizes. Each dossier will be an inside a Ziploc bag. There will be a cover that says it is an Endor dossier, and it has Dalmatian spots on it, as well as a picture of a cute dog. Not enough incentive yet? Well, each dossier will contain a raffle ticket that, when returned to the briefing room, will enter you in a drawing to win a few brand new blasters. You still want more? It will also contain this year's exclusive dossier sticker. Do you still want more? They will also contain the End War trading cards that are being produced by the head of our art department, Judah Kenya. Stickers, raffle tickets, trading cards, cute doggy picture, bragging rights. Is that enough incentive yet? Oh, and there's one more thing. Every 10 dossiers turned in by the humans will earn them extra ammo for the BFG this year. So what's a BFG? The BFG is a weapon that has to be earned, but it has the power to temporarily take down special infected. The humans want the BFG, trust us. So how do you get this year's BFG? The answer is more dossiers. Without going into too much detail just yet, know that there will be a separate set of seven dossiers to unlock the BFG. Unlike the 101, we'll narrow down the location of these with circles on a map of campus. A combination of finding the BFG dossiers and some puzzle solving will earn you this special weapon. And once you have it, you get more ammo for it the more you find the 101 dossiers. Make sense? So a quick recap. There are 101 dossiers that can be found by anyone, human or zombie. There are lots of cool prizes for finding them. They can be found anywhere that is in play. An additional seven dossiers are out there to unlock the BFG. Those can only be found by humans. The more of the 101 dossiers you find, the more ammunition you will get for the BFG. And that's it. We hope you'll get a chance during this year's HVZ End War to partake in one of the greatest Athens traditions and go out hunting for dossiers. They make great trophies and awesome stories. Thanks, Tyler! In just a minute here, the video will conclude and you will be on your way. Make sure you have a paper bracelet before you leave the room. Your next step will be blaster check. Moderators will be approving the blasters and ammunition you plan to use at End War. So if you have anything in your car, make sure you go get it now. If a blaster is singled out for additional screening, the moderator will be shooting three darts from the blaster through a chronometer. If its firing rate averages higher than 130 FPS, you may not use it. Put it away ASAP. After that, if you don't have anything else to do, check outside for moderators giving a tour of campus. Or go pick up your orange bandana if you don't have one yet. Remember, you're not in play until you participate in your first mission. Now, let's take a look at our schedule for the weekend. Over the next few days, we will be giving you objectives to complete in the form of missions. They should take around an hour to complete a piece, not including walking time. Missions are the focal points of HVZ. They are the meat of the gameplay, while free play and dossiers are the side dishes. Completing these tasks will earn you an easier time in the missions to come, and likewise, failing or not participating will make things harder. It all wraps up with a final mission, called the Final Stand, where all your previous decisions and accomplishments will determine just what you're up against. You should be aware, by the way, that our writing style for these missions is pretty whimsical. This is in no way intended to be a realistic zombie apocalypse simulation. If that's what you're expecting, then adjust your expectations now. For example, in real life, would a person be more concerned about completing their chores than finding a safe haven from the zombie apocalypse? No. Are we going to ask you to help that person with their chores anyway? Absolutely. Do you have to do it? Well, no. You don't have to do anything. You can always choose to skip a mission, and you are always able to abandon a mission at any time for any reason. Know that this will come with in-game consequences, but if you need to skip to take care of yourself, do it! End War is a marathon, not a sprint. However, if you're skipping missions entirely because you're afraid or because it seems difficult, then you're probably missing the point of HVZ altogether. HVZ is supposed to make you feel scared, paranoid, and even anxious at some times. And it's supposed to be hard, and you're probably not going to survive the way that we write our games. If you do survive, it's because you absolutely earned it. 
That's why we don't say the point of the game is to win. It's to live as long as you can and go out in a blaze of glory. Now, as for the actual schedule, Mission Zero takes place on Friday. It's what we like to refer to as a warm-up mission. It's very difficult, and everyone who participates will likely die horribly. But that's okay, because Mission Zero doesn't count. Anyone who dies in Mission Zero just comes back as a human afterwards, if they would like to. The first event on Saturday is a pep rally and welcome to the event from Drac, followed by missions 1 through 4 with some breaks in between. On Sunday, we wrap things up with mission 5, the final stand, and an awards ceremony. During this time, you will frequently find yourself interacting with the briefing building, so let's very quickly cover that building. For the most part, we will be in Morton Hall. Although there is one additional briefing building in Walter. And like we said, the parking lot and area surrounding Morton Hall, the main briefing building, is considered a no-play zone. You're welcome to hang out in here while waiting for the next briefing. But when briefings are not in session, some of our rooms will take on an alternate role. Room 218 is a designated blaster modding area. If you need an area to fix your blaster, this is where you'll want to do it. Room 122 is our designated medic room. If you're in need of first aid or water or just need to take a break, this is where you can do it. And room 215 is the moderator break room. It is meant to be a quiet place for moderators to take a break from their duties when things become a little too overwhelming. Do not knock on this door unless it's an emergency. Or if you come bearing gifts of food or drink. Otherwise, go to room 201. Room 201 is considered our main briefing room. If you're looking for a moderator to answer a question or to get a briefing ticket, room 201 is your best bet. It's also where our props are stored and the game director's natural habitat. A moderator is scheduled to be in this room at all times. That being said, please keep yourself and your belongings, without permission, out from behind the tables at the front of the room. Everything on and behind the tables should be moderator related. Finally, make sure you keep in contact with the mods. Our easiest way to get a hold of everyone is via the End War Game Update page, which can be found at facebook.com slash HBZ End War Updates. If you don't have a Facebook and you're registered, we will also be sending you emails anytime there is an important game change. You can also stay in the loop by adding us on Snapchat or Instagram. Phew, I think I covered everything. Now, please stand by for a moderator to answer any questions you may have come up with during this presentation.